Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson at Excel International A Level Chemistry Unit 2 for May 2021. This is the part 1 video. I'll put the links to the part 2 and part 3 videos below in the description box. Let's begin with the first question. Question 1, which is the correctly labeled reaction profile for an exothermic reaction. In an exothermic reaction, products should be lower in energy than the reactants. This should be the enthalpy change. That should be the activation energy. So A comes out to be our answer. However, before we move forward, we can try to see why the other answers were wrong. You can see here they place the enthalpy change in the wrong position and the activation energy in the wrong position. Here the products are higher in energy than the reactants and that is also wrong. And lastly, here we see the products are higher in energy than the reactants. So when you look at all the possible answers, the only correct answer was A because the reactants are higher in energy, the products are lower in energy, enthalpy change is positioned correctly, and the activation energy is in the right position. Moving on. Question two. The equation for a reaction is, as we can see here, we see two moles of carbon react with oxygen to give us carbon monoxide. And again, that is two moles, which is the correct symbol for the enthalpy change for this reaction. Looking at the possible answers, A is enthalpy change of atomization, Atomization should be when one mole of gaseous atom is produced, but we see here two moles are produced. Enthalpy change of combustion should be when one mole of carbon is burned completely in excess oxygen, but here we see two moles, so that is also wrong. Enthalpy change of formation should be when it's coming from its elements, but again one mole of product is formed, so that's wrong. So this is just enthalpy change of a reaction, and the answer should be a D. Question 3. The graph shows how the concentration of iodine changes with time in a reaction. So we can see as the reaction progresses, you can see as time increases, the concentration of iodine is increasing. So the question here says, what is the value for the rate of reaction in mole per decimeter cubed per second at 8 seconds? When a question comes like this, you have to draw a tangent at time is equal to 8 seconds, like I did here, draw a tangent at that point and find the gradient of that tangent. I got a change in y divided by the change in x, so that minus that divided by that minus that. And I got this, which gave me 0 0.011. And the answer that corresponds to that is 0 0.01, so A is my answer. Moving on. Question 4 says, the solid line on the graph below shows the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for an uncatalyzed reaction. Ea is the activation energy for this reaction. So we can see these are graphs showing reactions carried out at different temperatures. This is going to be the lower temperature, and this is going to be the highest temperature. You can, of course, see how the shapes of the curves are. The question asks which row shows the correct Maxwell-Boltzmann curve and activation energy for the reaction at a higher temperature with a catalyst. Of course, Y is for the higher temperature. With a catalyst, the activation energy for that reaction should be lower. Therefore, this should be the catalyzed reaction so my answer should be where W corresponds to the activation energy and Y corresponds to the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve for higher temperature. The answer is C. Down here they say, what is the oxidation number of chromium in this compound? So we see, we know the oxidation state of sodium is 1, so 1 times 2 gives us a 2. Since that of chromium is unknown, we can say 2x because there are two chromiums, and each of oxygen is minus 2. This should equal to the oxidation state of the whole compound, which is zero. And when we do some mathematics, we see X is going to be plus six. So in this compound here, chromium is plus six oxidation state. Moving on. Question six says, in an oxide of nitrogen, the oxidation number of nitrogen is plus four, which is the formula of the oxide. In this case, we have to find out where nitrogen is going to be plus four. But we know oxygen is going to be minus 2 in all these compounds because there is no peroxide, there is no elemental oxygen, and oxygen is not bonded to fluorine, so all the oxidation states of oxygen here are minus 2. So in here, when we say 2x, because 2 nitrogens minus 2 gives us 0, we get x is plus 1, so nitrogen is plus 1. In here, nitrogen is plus 3. If you do not know the oxidation state of this, we say x, so 2 times x. Minus 6, because this oxygen is minus 2, gives us 0. And the answer becomes plus 3. In here, nitrogen is plus 4, and here nitrogen is plus 5. So this is the compound we are looking for, where the oxidation state of nitrogen is plus 4. 
So for question six, C is the answer. Question seven says, hydrogen peroxide breaks down into water and oxygen. In terms of oxidation and reduction, how do hydrogen and oxygen change in this reaction? You need to remember that hydrogen is always plus one, except if it's bonded to a metal. So in this case, this is oxygen. So hydrogen is one and oxygen is minus one. In here, hydrogen is plus one, oxygen is minus two. In here, oxygen is zero. So our answer is going to be D because the oxidation state of hydrogen is unchanged. It's plus one here and plus one there. While oxygen is oxidized as well as reduced, this is a disproportionation reaction where negative one changes to minus two as well as zero. So the answer here should be a D. Moving on, question eight, several factors affect ionization energies. Number one, the number of protons increases. Number two, the outer electron is further from the nucleus. Number three, the amount of shielding increases. And number four, the number of unpaired outer electrons increases. They say which factors explain the decrease in ionization energy as group one is descended. We know as we descend down group one, the number of protons increases, and then the shielding effect increases because we have greater number of shells, or we have an increase in the number of shells, the outer electron is farther away from the nucleus. Increasing the number of protons would increase the ionization energy. So this factor here does not cause a decrease. It should cause an increase. What causes a decrease is increase in shielding effect, as well as the electrons being farther away from the nucleus. Therefore, we can conclude that the answer to question eight is a B. These two factors, that and that, are gonna lead to a decrease in ionization energy. Moving on. So question nine says, Separate samples of some halogen alkanes were dissolved in ethanol and a few drops of silver nitrate solution added. The faster the reaction of the halogen alkane, the quicker a precipitate forms. Question S says which of these halogen alkanes reacts the fastest? Looking at these possible answers, here we have a carbon iodide bond. We know that is going to be the weakest bond and therefore it should break the fastest in order to release the iodide that should react with silver nitrate in order to form the precipitate. Here we have a carbon bromide bond which is stronger than the carbon iodide, so this is gonna take longer. Here we have a carbon chloride which is gonna take longer and a carbon fluoride which is gonna take longer. So the answer should be an A because the carbon iodide bond is going to be the weakest and therefore easiest to break in order to release the iodide which will react with silver nitrate to form a precipitate. For part B, they say which of these halogen alkanes reacts the fastest. When we look at all these structures, they are carbon bromide bonds. So the difference should be whether one is primary, secondary, or tertiary, because the tertiaries are going to be easily broken. So this is primary, that is primary, that is tertiary, and this is secondary. If you cannot see that this is primary, try to draw the structure, you'll see it's going to be a primary halogen alkane. So since we know the tertiary halogen alkanes, there is going to be inductive effect that causes the carbon bromide bond to break easily and therefore releasing the bromide, which will react with the silver nitrate, forming a cream precipitate. So the answer here should be a B, that tertiary will break faster because they are all carbon bromide bonds. Question 10, what is the structure of 2-bromo, 3-chloro, 2-methylbutane? Now, because this subbutane, we need four carbons, which is one, two, three, and four. There is a bromo on carbon two, which is that. There is a methyl on carbon two, which is that. And there is a chloro on carbon three, which is that. So any structure having something similar to this should be our answer. And that means this is going to be the answer. You can see there is a bromo on carbon two, a methyl on carbon two. And because this is our carbon three, there is a chloro there. So the main chain is one, two, three, and four. And the rest is the same. A is the answer to question 10. Moving on. Question 11. Which structure represents a primary halogen alkane? To answer this question, we have to look through all the possible structures. Beginning with part A, this is the longest chain, which has four carbons. And Cl is on carbon two, so that is a secondary halogen alkane. When we look at part B, we can see, again, this could be the longest chain. And Cl is on carbon two, so that is not primary. So here Cl is on carbon one, so that is primary. And finally, we have this where the longest chain could be that. So Cl is on carbon two, that is not primary. So our possible answer is C. Moving on. Question 12, which could be the infrared spectrum 
of this compound given here, this compound. So when we look at this compound, there should be a carbon-carbon double bond, and there is an oxygen-hydrogen bond. So there should be a stretch for oxygen-hydrogen as well as for the carbon-carbon double bond. Using the data booklet, this is going to be due to OH, but there is nothing due to the carbon-carbon double bond, so A is wrong. When we go to B, there is no peak for OH, but there is a peak for the carbon-carbon double bond, so that is not our answer. When we go to C, there is a peak due to OH, and there is also a peak due to the carbon-carbon double bond, so C could be our potential answer. Down here, there is no outstanding peak for OH, although there is a peak for carbon-carbon double bond. So remember, you have to look at the outstanding peaks. The possible answer is a C because we have a peak due to OH and there is a peak due to the carbon-carbon double bond. Question 13. The mass spectrum of propanon is shown below. I draw the structure of propanon here. So the question says which fragment is most likely to produce the peak at mass to charge 43? When the fragmentation occurs here, we'll have a CH3 plus and that. So this is 15 and that is 43. However, there is also a possibility of the molecular ion peak, which is at 58. So the possible fragment should be this one here. And my answer is going to be a B. Question 14. A formal per decimeter cube solution of an acid is used to prepare dilute solutions of acid. What volume of water is required to make up 150 centimeters cubed of 0.35 mol per decimeter cube solution of the acid? So they've given us the information. We have the volume, we have the concentration. So I began by calculating the number of moles. The desired moles should be concentration times volume, which is that times that. And the number of moles we have got are these. Now, if you want to find the volume of this acid that will give those corresponding number of moles, we know volume is number of moles divided by concentration. And here, we will use the number of moles divided by the concentration we have here. And that gives us the volume in decimeters cubed as that, which is the same as that in centimeters cubed. So since we have the volume of acid at 13.125 centimeters cubed, 150 minus 13.125 will give us approximately 136.9 centimeters cubed, and therefore the answer should be a D. Moving on. Question 15. A pellet of sodium hydroxide has a mass of 0 0.700 grams. Some pellets were dissolved to make 350 centimeters cubed of 0 0.25 mol per decimeter cubed solution. Here they've given us the molar mass value of sodium hydroxide is 40 gram per mole. They ask how many pellets were dissolved. Now here I've been given the volume as well as the concentration. I'm going to begin by calculating the number of moles. Number of moles should be the concentration times the volume. The volume is 350, but I divide it by 1000 to convert it to decimeters cubed. So that times that gives me 0 0.0875 mole. Now these are the number of moles made from crushing a specific number of pellets. So the total mass of the pellets containing these number of moles should be number of moles times the molar mass, which is going to be 0 0.0875 times 40, and therefore it gives us 3.5 grams. Now the number of pellets should be 3.5 divided by 0 0.7 because each was 0 0.7, and the answer is going to be 5 pellets. So the answer to question 15a is a b. Question b says, 25 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide solution prepared in A was placed in a conical flask and titrated with sulfuric acid. This is the equation for that reaction. They say calculate the number of moles of sulfuric acid that reacted. We know from above that the number of moles of sodium hydroxide in the 350 was 0.0875 moles. So the moles of sodium hydroxide in the 25 should be 0.0875 divided by the 350 times 25, which gives us that. These are the number of moles in the 25 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide. So when we look at the reaction, the mole ratio of sodium hydroxide to the acid is 2 to 1. Therefore, the moles of sulfuric acid should be a half these moles, which gives us 3.125 times 10 power negative 3 mole. And when we change from standard form, the closest answer is 0.0031 mole. So the answer to question 15b should be an A. Down here they say, Phenolphthalein indicator was used for titration in B. What was the color change at the end point? Because sodium hydroxide was placed in the conical flask, the indicator must have been put in sodium hydroxide. Now we know phenolphthalein in alkali is going to be pink. And at the end point, since we are using sulfuric acid, the color changes to colorless. So B is going to be the answer, pink to colorless. 
Moving on. Question 16 says, which silver halides are soluble in concentrated aqueous ammonia? When you combine nitric acid and silver nitrate with a chloride, we get a white precipitate. In indilute ammonia, it's soluble. In concentrated ammonia, it's soluble. The bromide will form a cream precipitate with this combination, which is insoluble in dilute ammonia, but becomes soluble in concentrated ammonia. And then the iodide forms a yellow precipitate that will not be soluble in all. So the only ones that will be soluble in concentrated ammonia are silver chloride as well as silver bromide. Silver iodide will never dissolve. So the answer to this should be a C. Question 17. What volume in decimeters cubed of hydrogen gas will be produced when 3.00 grams of lithium is reacted with water at room temperature and pressure, which is RTP? This is the equation for the reaction, and they've given us the molar gas volume at room temperature and pressure as 24 decimeter cube per mole. So since we're given this information here, I began by calculating the number of moles of lithium, which should be the mass, divide by the molar mass you can get from the periodic table, and these are the moles of lithium contained in 3 grams. But we can see the mole ratio of lithium to hydrogen is 2 to 1, therefore the moles of hydrogen are going to be a half the moles of lithium, which gives us an approximate of about that. Since we know that number of moles should be volume of gas divided by molar volume, the volume of gas should be the number of moles times the molar gas volume, which is 0 0.217391 times the 24, which is that, which gives us an answer approximately this, which we can round off to 5.22. Therefore, C is the answer to question 17. So this brings us to the end of this video, which is the first part for this paper. Thank you for being with us. Don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.